Good morning. There are two passages that we will be looking at this morning. One is from Luke 4, 1 through 2, and the second one is from Luke 5, 12 through 16. The first one from Luke 4. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they ended, he was hungry. Now from Luke 5, 12. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. This is the word of the Lord. A few years ago, we were preparing to do a sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount, and we contacted um, a particular theologian that had written a book about the Sermon on the Mount to see it, if he would give us some time just to kind of uh, talk through what it, would, what it would look like to preach through the Sermon on the Mount, and he graciously did. He was the head of a, a PhD program at a seminary, and um, one of the things he told us in um, preparing to write that book as he said, um, often I found in the Christian life, particularly with Protestants, he said that, that we have this vertical nature of our relationship with God sewn up, right? We, we live there. But he said there's another aspect of life in Christ in the Christian life, which is horizontal, living with one another. And he said, what I found as I've read a lot on the Sermon on the Mount and looked at the life of Christ is that the writings in the Protestant world around the life of Christ always want to do this. So they want to, in other words, they want to turn everything vertically, that it's always about our justification. It's always about being made right with God. But he said, there's a, a vacuum of writing and thinking around how Protestants engage the life of Christ horizontally, the way he lives. And he said the Sermon on the Mount is horizontal living. It's not about how you're made right with God. It's about how you live rightly in the world. And so I think he was right on with that. And I share that because we are in the midst of a series where we're looking at the life and the teachings of Christ that bring to the surface practices of the spiritual life. And what we find in these practices often is that because they are a part of the example of Christ, we as Protestants can sort of diminish the, the importance of those practices. See, we've rightly said it is only through the work of Christ that we are reconciled and brought into relationship with God. But then we've unfortunately sometimes played that truth against the life of Christ as an example to follow. And we know we've done this because we can say something like, Christ is not our example, he's our savior, and we, we just say amen, rather than, hold on, maybe, maybe that's not fully true. It is true that Christ is our savior, and by virtue of being the savior, he is also our example. And this is not a side truth of the Christian life. This is the very nature of the Christian life. This is a primary truth. So in this series... We're drawing upon the spiritual practices we see in the life and teachings of Jesus and seeing how we can take up those practices ourselves, practices that move us from acknowledging information about who God is, good information, true information, but 
taking that information about Jesus into the presence and power of the Father who transforms us by the Spirit. And as we unapologetically this morning look at the example of Christ's life, we see that solitude was an embedded practice in his life. Here's what we're going to hear this morning. This, this main point we're going to hear throughout the sermon. Through solitude, we retreat from the de demands and distractions of life to be fully present with God. Through solitude, we retreat from the demands and distractions of life to be fully present with God. Let's pray this morning and then we'll get to the text. Lord, thank you that you offer us your presence. God, what an amazing offer. Lord, that one we can one that we can lose sight of in the midst of life's demands and distractions. So Lord, would you bring us back to this offer this morning that we can take up and come to know through the experience and practice of solitude. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So first this morning, we're going to look at our need for solitude. Our need for solitude. Thankfully, and maybe not thankfully, life tells us just the way we live day after day tells us that we need this practice. I probably don't even have to spend a lot of time bolstering this idea that we need solitude. But nevertheless, let's look at it as a reminder. Most fundamentally, our need for solitude is brought to the surface because Jesus practiced it. Jesus lived his life without sin and is the perfect example of what life with God looks like. Therefore, if Jesus needed and practiced solitude, it is undoubtedly a good practice for us as well. And the book of Luke uniquely brings to the surface this practice, this rhythm of solitude in the life of Jesus. The text that we read this morning, that Avani read for us from Luke 4, was the first thing Jesus does before he goes public with his ministry. And we read in Luke 4, 1 and 2, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The first act of Jesus' ministry was not a public one. It was an act of solitude. He withdraws to the wilderness, a place where nobody lives, and he is in solitude for 40 days. And we read what he did when he returned from solitude in Luke 5, verses 12 through 16, which was the other text we read this morning. And we see that Jesus was in one of the cities, and there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, can you make me clean? And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as, as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now, even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places to pray. Jesus comes back from the desert, and he heals a man riddled with leprosy. And people hear about it, and they come to Jesus, if you notice there in verse 15, to hear him. In other words, to be taught by him and to be healed by him. These are good things, right? Jesus has ministry momentum. And every pastor gets excited about ministry momentum. Like certainly he's going to, he's going to seize upon this opportunity. But what does he do? But he would withdraw to desolate places to pray. Wasn't that irresponsible? I mean, these people want healing and they want to be taught. And Jesus leaves them. 
This is the pattern of Jesus' life and ministry. From solitude with the Father to significant communal work. Back into solitude with the Father and back into giving of himself in ministry. His ministry begins not in public. Not, not coming down in the middle of the Super Bowl. Right? He goes into the wilderness where no one is. It starts with being fully present with his Father. He goes on to continue this practice in his life. We see it in Luke 6, 11, and 12. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And right after this, he comes back, and he has the discernment to appoint the 12 disciples. And then in Luke 9, 18, now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? He's by himself, but now he's invited the disciples within distance to see, to see the very life of being alone with the Father. And this becomes normal. We see in Luke 22, and he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. This custom is probably speaking of his prayer life. As he, and he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And this is, he's in Gethsemane, right? And he's about to enter into this great sacrifice. And what does he do? He goes to be alone with the Father. And he invites the disciples to be present with him in that. See, Jesus' work with others emanated from a place of being fully present with the Father. Why was this so foundational to Jesus' life? And why, perhaps, might it not be so foundational to ours? Maybe the answer is found in two forces that are inherent challenges to life with God in a fallen world. The demands of life and the distractions of life. Demands come in the form often of expectations that, that people or perhaps our places of employment or school place Upon us, and not all those expectations or demands are, are wrong or unjustified. Right? If we're going to become parents, it's going to demand something of us. If we're going to do a graduate degree, it's going to demand something of us, and rightly so. But some of those expectations are not rightly placed upon us. And if we try to live up to everyone's expectations, we will find the practice of solitude to be close. To impossible. Even if we're able to wrestle some, some times of solitude away from the demands, it will be spent often consumed by people's expectations of us. Any of you ever feel that? That when you get alone, you're rehearsing perhaps your failure of, um, or your failure that someone might have expected of you. One of the Aspects of life with Christ and in Christ is learning to be at peace when we disappoint people for the right reasons. It's a hard lesson, isn't it? It's hard to do that in life. But Jesus, do you think the crowd was disappointed when they showed up to be taught by Jesus and healed by Jesus? And he's like, sees them coming and he takes off. Probably. They're probably, why, why is he running, right? Just... See dust coming up as Jesus departs to be with the Father. This is one of the aspects of life with Christ is learning to disappoint people for the right reasons. Jesus certainly disappointed the crowds who gathered to hear him and be healed by him. But he did it for the right reasons. He says, honestly, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to bear this weight unless I'm with my Father. We also have 
distractions. Demands aren't the only force that keeps us from solitude. Distractions are another powerful force. And distractions are a distraction is shifting our attention from something of greater importance to something of lesser importance. When distraction becomes pervasive in our lives, it begins to detrimentally affect our relationships and our responsibilities. And we find ourselves given to the less important at the neglect of the clearly more important. And the most fundamental issue of distraction is being distracted from God himself. Consumed by a million lesser things that don't feel like lesser things in the moment. We fail to be with God himself, to hear his voice and rest in his presence so that we can put the demands and distractions of life in their proper place. Luke gives us a very clear picture of the outcome of a life filled with demands and distraction in Luke chapter 10. If you remember, Jesus is visiting Mary and Martha. Do you guys remember this story? And is busy in Martha's busy in the kitchen while Jesus is in her home teaching by his words and by his presence. And Martha complains to her sister Mary. And honestly, when you read it, you're like, oh, I get it. Yeah, you should be complaining. Like, you're a whirlwind of activity and she's just sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's running around doing all the work while Mary just sits to listen to Jesus. And when Jesus hears... Martha complained to Mary. Here's what Jesus says in Luke 10, verses 41 and 42. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. What a picture. The demands and distractions of our lives can look or can bear on us very much like it did on Martha. At face value, Martha was doing good things. She was serving for the sake of her guests. She was giving of herself for the sake of others. But Jesus sees through it for what it is. It's anxious toil. She's anxious about feeding everyone and anxious about everyone might th- what everyone might think of her hospitality. We know that feeling. We all know it. Martha was driven by demands that distracted her from the very presence of Christ. Yet, like many of us, she didn't recognize it until Jesus helped her see her own heart. Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Sound familiar to anybody? Jesus understood this. He understood the demands and distractions. And this is why when the crowds came to him for good things, he sought solitude. So that ultimately he could give them. So what do we mean by solitude. What is the substance of solitude? The substance of solitude we see in Psalm 62, a psalm of David helps us with this. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. Notice in verse 1, it seems to be a prayer, a desire. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, from him comes my salvation. In verse 5, it changes to David actually preaching to himself and telling himself to do it. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for hope is from him. Sometimes we have to preach to ourselves in the midst of life's distractions and remind our souls to wait for God alone. 
And so we see in verse 1 the three aspects of solitude. I'm borrowing here from an author named John Stark, who's a pastor in New York. He has a book called The Possibility of Prayer that I would, I would encourage you guys to get. It's a really good book. He's a pastor in our network of churches that we're a part of, Harbor Network. And he has some really good stuff to say about solitude. But he, he takes that first verse and he says, this really is the three aspects of solitude. So let's look at these real quick. The three aspects of solitude. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For God alone. For God alone. Right away, we are given the aim of solitude. The aim of solitude is God himself. Solitude is not simply me time or alone time. It's not simply escaping the demands and distractions of life for a moment, though that can be good. The practice of solitude in the life of Christ was about reorienting his entire life upon God. And this is important because so much of our lives naturally become oriented on ourselves, our goals, our desires, our careers, our responsibilities. Again, those are not bad things. But we can easily slip into the totality of our lives being about ourselves, our desires, our longings. And we can get stuck in an incessant loop of our lives terminating on and in us. But solitude pulls us out of self-orbit. It says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. So, for God alone, my soul waits. Waiting is one of the most loathsome things we can do, right? When you hear waiting, no one thinks, oh, that sounds great. No, in our culture, waiting is not a good thing. Who sees a long line at the grocery store and thinks, oh, great, what an opportunity to meet some new people. <laughs> we'll even pay extra money to avoid waiting in line at Disneyland on top of all the money we've already spent to get into Disneyland just so we don't have to wait. And when we do have to wait, we're often immediately reaching for something to get us through that time of waiting. Usually our phone these days, right? Something to entertain me. Something to get me through this horrific five minutes of waiting. Or in Disneyland, two hours of waiting. And so the temptation is to do anything but wait. Impatience begins to rise to the surface. And I understand it because impatience gives us a quick fix. When someone frustrates, uh, frustrates us, it feels good to react and give them a piece of our minds, doesn't it? It feels good in the moment. It feels immediately like relief, but not in the long run. In the long run, we usually end up regretting it, and rightfully so. But patience is just the opposite. Patience says when someone frustrates us and we're patient and gentle, as Scripture calls us to be, and we speak with both self-control and firmness, it feels in the moment like death because it is a death to self. But in the end, it's far more satisfying and redemptive. Why? Because we are waiting for the right thing. Waiting for satisfaction to come on God's terms, not our own. Solitude is the deliberate practice of patiently waiting on God to satisfy us. Because in the end, we know there is no substitute. It says... God alone, for God alone my soul waits. It's like if you're waiting at Disneyland for Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's the best ride at Disneyland. Don't argue with me. It's true. And someone comes up to you and they say, here's a yo-yo. I'll give it to you if you get out of line. Who would go, oh, sweet, a yo-yo. <laughs> Nobody. But that's what we do 
when we don't wait for God alone. Is we take up a yo-yo, some other trinket, rather than God himself who deeply satisfies. Solitude is the deliberate practice of patiently waiting on God to satisfy us because we know in the end there is no substitute for God himself. And finally, we wait in silence. From waiting to silence, from the frying pan into the fire, we don't like silence either, do we? We don't like silence any more than waiting. Imagine going to the grocery store, the same one where they have the long lines, and finding complete silence. People are there, but there's no music playing. No one's talking, only silent shopping. It's creepy, right? Sounds like a horror movie. Or when you're getting to know someone and you hit that point where neither of you can think of anything to say. Awkward. We have been formed to react negatively to silence as well. We don't know what to do with silence. Silence to us means something is wrong or something is off. But not so with God. Silence with God is not just the absence of noise, though that's part of it. Silence with God is listening. Silence with God is listening and hearing. See, solitude moves us from being the primary actor and communicator to a posture of reception, of listening. So, for God alone... My soul waits in silence. This is solitude. How do we do it? How do we practice solitude? We want to we bring this all the way down to the ground, each one of these practices. And again, as a reminder, we have one more week. Next week, we're going to look at the practice of Scripture. And then the week after that, we're going to look at how to bring all of this together into our lives so that they actually can become rhythms of our lives, not just more busyness we add on to our lives. So how do we do it? How do we practice solitude? Here, here are maybe sort of five steps, broad steps to begin to think about. And as with any of these things, all of our lives look different. So we'll have to work these rhythms into our lives depending on the season of life we're in. But first, as much as possible, silence all demands and distractions. So that could be going in your car at lunchtime. That could be a place in your house that tends to be silent and free from distractions. That could even be wherever you are in the moment, closing your eyes for a minute. So as much as possible, silence all demands and distractions. If possible, set a timer. You can't always do this, but what that does is that keeps you from looking at your watch every three minutes. Because we are waiting in silence we're probably going to get antsy in the midst of solitude, especially if this is a new practice for us. So maybe you set it for five minutes. And maybe you actually initially, because we're not accustomed to it, only spend one of those minutes actually in solitude and silence with God. That's okay. There's grace. Third, invite God to speak. Invite God to speak. Fourth, pay attention to the thoughts, feelings, and impressions that rise in you. Now, we start to get really squirrely right here. What do you mean, impressions? Next thing you know, you'll be doing seances, right? No. The Spirit of God resides in us. And he brings his word to bear in our lives. And so, as we invite God to speak to us, thoughts, feelings, and impressions rise in us. An impression, for example, may be someone that you told you were, told them you were going to pray for them, and you haven't. I need to pray for them, or I need to reach out to that person. 
thoughts and feelings that rise. As we were, this morning, as we were confessing during our 45 seconds of silence, you know what I was thinking about? Tomorrow night our gospel community begins and we haven't figured out child care yet. That's what I was thinking about. So you know what I did in the moment? I was like, Lord, this is, obviously this is heavy on my mind, so I give it to you. And also this prompt up on the screen, help me with that also. <laughs> That's what it looks like sometimes. That is the reality of life in the world. In minds and hearts and lives that tend to be going in way too many directions. And then those thoughts, those feelings, those impressions, those impressions that rise in you, direct those thoughts, feelings, and impressions in, in prayer. Bring them before the Father. Lord, I give these things to you. But let the Lord speak. The Lord, the Lord speaks to us. I remember at one time someone else in the church and I were at a pastor's conference in Dallas Willard was there and we had a moment to talk to Dallas Willard. If you guys don't know him, he's, he's no longer alive, but he uh, was kind of a, the spiritual practices were sort of his thing. And the person I was with, uh, as Dallas Willard gave us a moment, said, I, I'm wrestling with God speaking to us because Dallas Willard had been talking about that in the moment. And he said, and so he asked Dallas Willard, do, do, do you really think God speaks to us or something along those lines? And, and Dallas Willard leaned into him and he said, son, do you want God to speak to you? And he said, and Dallas Willard said, then he will. And he walked off to go to the bathroom or whatever he was going to do. That was a whole combo. Some of our rationalistic minds, we don't know what to do with asking the Lord to speak to us. And can I simply say, I'm not, we don't have ten steps to that. What we have is trust and dependence upon God who is with us, that will speak to us. Yes, through his word, by his word, but he will bring that, he will customize that word to your life and to my life. And we can trust that he will do that. I also want to say this, that solitude is possible for anyone and everyone, no matter what stage of life you're in. Solitude is not only possible for those that can get away to the mountains one day a week. Solitude is possible for those who juggle careers and kids and community and school and caring for parents and second jobs and side hustles. Solitude is on offer to all of us. It's possible for anyone. I heard a, a great conversation recounted to me this week by Jordan Ankenman, who's our deacon of, of care here, and April Ispas, who is our deacon of spiritual formation. They were having a conversation, and I got their permission, by the way, to share this. I'm not going to, if we have a conversation, I'm not going to share it on Sunday morning, I promise. But Jordan said, I was just wrestling with, like, feeling like I want to get away. Like, I want to get, I, my life's so busy. So he told April, he said something along the lines of, um, I just don't have the time to get away. Like, to get up in the mountains and experience the Lord. And April said, well, why don't you let the Lord come to you? And Jordan was like, that's what he, when he told the story, that's what he did. He's like, Yeah. Why don't I let God meet me in the midst of life, in the midst of what I'm doing day after day? So this solitude can look like 10 minutes in your car at lunch. It can look like waking up 10 minutes earlier than you normally would. It can look like as you lay down in bed in silence, even with your spouse next to you, let's have 10 minutes of silence before the Lord. The Lord will meet us in that. Which brings us finally to the yield of solitude. What does solitude bring about in our lives? You may have noticed at this point in this series that each of the practices of the Christian life, of the life of Christ, issue in greater life in God. They're portals into greater life in Christ. They bring us into the experience of some aspect of life with 
God that he intends for us to live into. So for Sabbath, it was this portal into rest in God. For prayer, it's the portal into communion with God. For fasting, it's satisfaction in God. And for solitude, it's communion with God's people, the community that he's given us. Just as we see in Jesus' life, so David comes out of his solitude and into encouraging the community of God's people in Psalm 62. Remember, for God alone my soul waits in silence. This is where he starts. And then in verse 5 he says, oh, my soul, essentially wait in silence. We need to do this. And listen to what he says in verse 8 of Psalm 62. Trust Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. He turns communal. He turns to God's people. John Stark in that book, The Possibility of Prayer, says this. In solitude, we do not merely find ourselves. We find ourselves in Christ. When we find ourselves in Christ, we don't have to search for security from or in others. We don't have to use human relationships to find what we can only find fully in Christ. We are free to love and listen and serve others out of that security. So much of communal discord and disruption that we experience in the life of God's people stem from not being secure in who we are in Christ And when we're not secure in who we are in Christ, we attempt to find that security in others. And in doing so, we place weight on other people that no finite fallen creature could possibly bear up under. And so we end up disappointed because inevitably the people fail us. But we're disappointed to the degree that we bring disruption to the community. All of this stems from not finding rest in God alone, not waiting for God alone in silence, but putting weight upon others that they could never bear up under and then blaming them when they fail. I know that's a lot, but this is sort of the dominoes that begin to fall when we don't have this life of solitude. When all the demands and distractions of life are at our doorstep, going back to be fully present with the Father so we can enter into those things with health and wholeness. We say all the time we were made for community, and that's true. But more than that, we are made for God. If all we ever did was engage community without solitude, we would all end up like Martha, anxiously serving the community as we are driven by the demands and distractions that communal life often entails. But this is not what God has for us. This is not what God has for us, Emmaus Church. He made us for himself. And so the goodness of community cannot be found apart from the goodness of solitude where we meet with him and we're fully present with him. Solitude is where God invites us to be fully present with him as we reorient our affections and frustrations on him. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. Nothing else will do. And with our lives reoriented on God, we come into the good gift of his people, able to give And receive the life of community that God intended. Able to overlook people's shortcomings. Able to keep no record of wrong. Able to extend forgiveness. And able to receive the same. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. And this kind of community life truly comes from God alone. And we're invited into it as we are fully present with the Father. Let's pray this morning. God, thank you. Thank you that Christ gives us the example of beginning his public ministry by 40 days of solitude. Lord, we see that example. And Lord, we 
We thank you that having been reconciled to God, the Spirit now resides in us to help us live that example out. Lord, would you make us people who practice solitude, who wait for God alone in silence. Lord, we pray that you would make Emmaus Church a community that through that solitude strengthens our life together. Through that practice of solitude, Lord, we find the help and the beauty of community, the gift you mean it to be. Lord, would you help us by the Spirit to wait for you, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.